Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm uh, Joseph Cutts. I'm an artist and curator um, based in Sheffield in the United Kingdom. And I've um, been warmly welcomed into the digital cultures family over the last few months uh, uh, and to help um, guide this festival, but also to wonderfully moderate today's uh, session, how art institutions welcome the notion of degrowth. So if there's ever a provocative title, that's certainly one. Um, before we begin um, in welcoming our uh, uh, attendees and participants today, the event is um, part of, of the fourth edition of Digital Cultures, um, Imagine Futures, which is organized by the wonderful Adam Mishkiewicz Institute in Warsaw, Poland. The festival itself that uh, has been taking place started on Saturday the 17th, um, just gone, and will most certainly continue until this Sunday the 25th, where we certainly encourage you to view the full program at uh, digitalcultures.pl. Um, but during the nature of, uh, of, of what we're about to um, experience over the next hour or so um, in this session, we welcome your questions and comments in the uh, in the chat um, upon the, among the application that you are using um, in the chat window, as well as um, there will be an option at the uh, very end in the Q&A for us selecting those questions that appear for posing them to our uh, presented participants and myself today uh, to answer, as well as a more informal Q&A session following that at the end, where if you are um, part of uh, the Zoom setup attending today, there will be an option to raise your hand, uh, in which case we can um, highlight you to be able to present your question. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to thank you all for attending on your across your multiple platforms today and like to um, before we welcome our speakers in a second say that if you are um, appearing via YouTube and Facebook we certainly encourage you to join the zoom webinar via the festival website to get the full experience of the event so please do go to digitalcultures.pl um, from there you can go to program and uh, when you see the event in the lineup um, click on the join button to get to get the more fuller experience of uh, what we're about to uh, go through here. So here we are, how art institutions can welcome the notion of degrowth. We have three wonderful uh, participants and speakers here that we're about to welcome to this platform, um, where we will be looking into uh, the cycle processes and research of uh, arts institutions, festivals and hybrid organizations uh, and their approach to sustaining potentially an increasing ecological and organic setup. Um, we may specifically highlight various models of environmentally friendly approaches in arts organizations while looking at curatorial research, exhibition platforms, resource and potentially travel. Whilst looking into areas of um, uh, uh, and the barriers, should I say, towards engagement uh, during this time. But we hope to explore areas of how to develop as an organization but aim to remain ethically balanced and uh, distance ourselves from global capitalist systems. So what we're going to experience over the next 45 minutes or so is three informal presentations. The first one is uh, from our wonderful guest, uh, Diane Drube, who's a museum strategist and founder of We Are Museums. Um, today, her main spearheads are around climate emergency, data openness and local communities engagement. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all and to welcome Diane Drube. Thank you, Joe. Um, it's uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'm very, very glad to be back here, even virtually. It has been always a real great pleasure to actually contribute to digital cultures. I think I came one or two times um, back, at the, back in the time I could travel to Warsaw. 
Um, so I'll try to let to tell you a little bit more about We Are Museums and how the growth made, made us um, take a, a huge shift actually last year. So yeah, just to give you an overview, the mission of, of We Are Museums is just like a treasure hunt for innovation in museums. Uh, we look everywhere, we dig where we can, and we meet people who are making change happen. And um, we've done that for the past eight years now. Uh, we have been organizing international gatherings for museum professionals, very much anchored locally. Um, we organized events in Vilnius, in Warsaw, in Berlin, in Bucharest, in Kuldiga, in Riga, in Marrakesh, in Paris, in Lyon, in Katowice. Um, and Katowice was actually the last um, big conference, a big gathering that we organized last year. And it was a fabulous moment. Um, and because I, I actually listed all these, these cities um, for something, yeah. Um, Really, really special. Uh, really, really special is that um, at We Are Museums, we actually take the time um, and we take the time to travel, so we can meet local partners and key local stakeholders. So we can really understand what are their needs, um, what are the main challenges that they are uh, facing, the main friction points, what are the main expertise that they are they are lacking, um, and so. By listening and really taking the time and meeting the people, we can curate the best events accordingly. And when I say actually taking the time, I even mean moving there, um, meaning that I personally lived in Vilnius, in Warsaw, in Berlin for this purpose, and then I traveled every two months in other places. Um, so it means that it was a lot of traveling. <laughs> um, but we actually felt that it was necessary. It was really important to meet all these people, to really talk, to take the time and to create very strong bonds. Um, so yeah, this is um, what we've done. Uh, we talked about different kind of big challenges of the museum um, field today, like digital transformation, local community engagement, the value of intangible heritage, the social impact of museums, and most recently the planetary emergency. Um, I can say that We Are Museums was always a place where people can feel um, that they can freely express themselves and find common challenges and develop cultural co courage and, and friendships. Um, it is not just a conference, it, it is something which is really based on solidarity. Um, sharing is caring has always been our main motto and um, inclusion, diversity, agility are always been our key values. And something which was really important for us is that no meritocracy and showing off, showing off um, will actually um, happen in in our gathering. So, if I say that, it's you will understand why. But I think it's really important to say that at We Are Museums, diplomas, job titles, and and the size of the the institution um, don't really matter. Um, but it's really the human being behind the project uh, which matter most. So, after doing that for the past eight years, what I actually learned is that uh, local impact and local change, micro changes, are not easy things to reach and it takes a lot of time and a lot of care. <laughs> um, what we start to see is that time is lacking, um, we are facing huge uh, challenges um, and, and travel is not possible so much for so many different reasons, like the current health crisis followed by the social and economic crisis is really showing that it's not possible anymore. Um, so actually, when we've done the last um, We Are Museums conference, gathering, meeting, um, uh, family weekend <laughs> uh, in Katowice last year, it was six months after COP21. Um, and uh, yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> um, and and we actually realized that um, this, because um, we dedicated half of our program to the topic of the planetary emergency, the biodiversity loss, um, 
and yeah, uh, all the different crises followed by the um, by climate change, we actually realized that after doing quite the same thing for eight years, we were actually facing critical revision of our model. That all these gatherings, international gatherings, um, were not really possible anymore. So um, I actually started to look at nature. I started to get familiar with biomimicry. Um, I started to learn a lot about indigenous cultures around the world. And actually the insights are quite simple. Um, regeneration is about the collective, the together, um, the commoning and about collaboration. And I actually felt, uh, I started to see we are museums differently. And I started to see that actually we are museums the power and the potential of We Are Museums was not really just about these, um, these events and, and actually meeting, meeting in a place and, and listening to experts um, and, and, and uh, enjoying some workshops together. But it was really about this sense of togetherness. Um, and I actually felt that, that the full potential of togetherness really appears when communication between people is continuous. And when um, we, as a whole, become really resilient to change. Um, and, and something that I kept repeating lately, that uh, change is actually the only constant in nature and the only constant in life. Um, so we should start to accept it and, and celebrate it. Um, so what we have done, we decided to stop actually uh, asking these fabulous people to meet to travel um to travel so much for for three or four days um but we started to think um really about the community to think about this togetherness to reuse to stop producing so much um to think about the long term and um and we came up with two different strands two different cycles um, the first one actually um, started when we started a collaboration with EIT Climate Kick. Um, we actually worked on this program called Museums Facing Extinction. So at first it was really about the extinction of, of um, biodiversity, the extinction of resources, and step by step. and, and by entering 2020, we actually realized that it could be the extension of museums, the extension of, of um, these uh, temporary exhibitions and these traveling exhibitions, or the extension of so many things that we, we were not even questioning before. Um, so we started this multi-year program of um, learning and practice sessions to try to create some wave um, some micro local changes, which will create some waves of transformation and climate action. Um, and trying to really show to museums that they are really amazing and really powerful agents of change. So, so this is yeah what, what we are working on now, um, starting a new program in Lithuania um, actually next week with uh, a key event um, at, at the Mo Museum, uh, which will be um, totally hybrid from the beginning. And um, we also actually decided to gather all the community online. So two weeks after the beginning of the um, European lockdown, um, we opened the online community of We Are Museums and it gathers, it gathers now more than 800 museum professionals coming from really everywhere, um, having different kind of challenges to, to, yeah, to, to offer and to, to suggest to the community to work on. And we decided to actually not just focus on, on, on small events, but just like for really focusing on continuous conversations and, and, and ongoing dialogues around big questions. Um, so we, we started um, a program last May with a museum for the United Nations about museum resilience. We will start a new program with ICOM Com Call about new collecting practices. Um, and also another one about the future of immersion with museum connections. So yeah, what is, what is quite important now and, and what I, I really learned is that um, 
after years of fostering care and innovation, um, I, I really strongly believe that our society cannot exist on a competitive model anymore, that monoculture efficiency and optimization are actually not fertile models. And it is really this notion of togetherness and benevolence and long-term thinking and continuous uh, dialogue um, which are keys if we actually want to want to move further um, and, and really try to support each other and to help each other. So um, yeah, this is the journey of, um, of We Are Museums and I actually feel and, and, and believe that it is a journey of uh, so many museums and they are uh, facing it in their daily life now even more. Um, all this pandemic really accelerated everything. Um, so yeah, this is how we um, replied to this degrowth um, notion. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane. I am uh, such wonderful food for thought there that I would love to circle back to um, in the Q&A, but also to um, consider and discuss more about if any challenges uh, have arisen or could potentially arise um, with working with a, a Lithuanian partner and understanding another territory during this time, and if there are any um, social um, or artistic barriers to overcome uh, and, and what those may be, should we consider um, today how we not only work internally, but how we work with other partners in other territories uh, during this time of uh, constant transition. Um, thank you so much for that. I'd now like to move on to the second part of this session uh, where we welcome our second participant, Jagna Lewandowska, um, who is a, a curator and film scholar, member of the New Roman Gallery Collective, who works at the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw, and uh, is co-curator of the wonderful exhibition, uh, The Penumbral Age, Art in a Time of Planetary Change, that I uh, was very fortunate to visit um, as I broke away from Sheffield to come to Poland not too many months ago. Um, that exhibition only recently closed last month, but I would now like to hand over to Jagna. So welcoming you. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to thank Anja Schiller and uh, Joe for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel. And you are right, Diane, this is our joint uh, edition now. Hello everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Anja Schiller and Joe Katz for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel and uh, Diane. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Anya and Joe asked me to share my experience of working on the exhibition during this uh, special chaotic uh, time of pandemic. So I will only focus on the fragment of this uh, broad uh, picture we are discussing and uh, tell something about my observations related to the exhibition, the Penumbral Age uh, Art in the Time of Planetary Change, which I co-curated with Sebastian Cichotsky at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in Warsaw. Our exhibition, which ended on uh, the 13th of September, will be a concrete uh, case study in this case, uh, which, however, I believe uh, can be translated into some uh, broader reflections on the current situation and the possible scenarios uh, for the institutions uh, in which uh, degrowth uh, term for sure will be very present. Uh, the Penumbral Age uh, uh, presented a series of artistic observations and uh, visualizations of changes taking place around the globe and co caused by humankind. The earliest work and documentation uh, that we have shown were created in the 60s, in a period where also uh, linked with uh, identification of uh, pacifist, uh, anti-racist, uh, feminist, and also the creation of uh, the uh, contemporary ecological movement. At the same time, the new artistic movements arose, uh, such as conceptualism or land art, and these were very important for us. And we expanded them by breaking the rigid modernist uh, framework with the contemporary practices. You can see the classic work of Robert Morris on the left and uh, very beautiful textile uh, made by Susan Husky uh, recently. And the title of the exhibition was inspired by the book you can see on the screens now. Uh, it was a fiction based uh, on the scientific research uh, when the period of penumbra 
was our current time. Like the authors who have used the fiction uh, to smuggle some expert knowledge uh, that is usually ignored in a daily rush, we decided to talk about the impact uh, of the human on our planet through very diverse uh, artistic uh, practices. And we were hoping that the content we ignore uh, every day uh, will be visible or even emotionally felt uh, when presented through art and very uh, and operating on different levels on sensitivity than bars, graphs and data. Uh, this is a very uh, special documentation of the Frozen exhibition uh, because uh, the exhibition was supposed to be open on the 20th of March and uh, the lockdown occurred in Poland one and a half uh, weeks before that date. So we suddenly stopped at the full speed. Uh, the invitations uh, were sent. Uh, the exhibition architecture were, was al almost finished and all the artworks uh, already arrived. And uh, the exhibition was uh, literally uh, frozen. And this is the documentation made by Rafał Milach uh, at the time of lockdown when Sebastian and I couldn't uh, even reach uh, the exhibition space. It was a very unique emergency situation in which the entire institution, the museum, had to switch uh, to the different mode uh, of operating, remote and online. And uh, when sharing the new materials uh, from the exhibition, we took uh, the great care not to reveal uh, too much. We also approached 3D renders and all the online exhibitions uh, that flooded the internet at the time with a great reserve. Of course, in the same term of accessibility, these ideas are great, but they are not a substitute uh, for a direct contact with art. Uh, and that was very clear to us from the very beginning. So we tried not to publish many reproductions of the works from the exhibition. Almost uh, all the narrative online was based on additional materials. For example, the video postcards uh, sent to us by the authors and writers uh, telling about uh, uh, the works that are going to be presented on the exhibition. We also uh, decided to symbolically launch the exhibition website on the day uh, of the plant opening. On this occasion in the evening, uh, the live DJ, DJ set uh, took place and it was a, a completely new experience for us. Uh, we were still experimenting with the internet tools uh, and it was of course uh, far away from the direct contact uh, with the public, but uh, at least we can see that there is someone on the other side uh, listening and hopefully waiting for the exhibition. And it was uh, very encouraging and gave us the energy for the further weeks. The next important step uh, was the decision to publish online our newspaper uh, guide and audio guides online before the opening. And after some time, it turned out to be a very a good solution. Uh, the audience came to the exhibition already equipped uh, with a certain amount of information and the viewing process seemed to be significantly deepened. Uh, what's funny, soon after the first articles and even reviews uh, appeared in the press and it was really weird because we haven't opened the exhibition yet. And at the same time, uh, museum uh, uh, began to uh, act as well. Uh, and there were several initiatives aimed uh, at maintaining the functioning of the institution and also to help uh, artists uh, around. Uh, the blog MSN Home Office was created and contained the materials related to the situation of artists in the pandemic. And thanks to the donators, a quick uh, response fund was also launched and enabled uh, quick non-grant based acquisition of work directly from artists. Uh, and many debates were organized, including two debates uh, focused on the uh, degrowth term, which was very uh, present in our heads as well. And so the life of the frozen exhibition went for two and a half months. And after this period, we were able to finally open the crates. Uh, and start to the installment, uh, also unusual because without the artists who obviously couldn't come uh, to Warsaw. So we ran around the pavilion with computers on which the Zoom with artists was activated uh, and we followed instructions, uh, often interrupted by some sounds of the drills in the background. 
And some of the work had to be built by the technical team with the components uh, that came from the artists. Uh, others had to be painted accordingly to the templates uh, sent by post. It was very peculiar. On the screen, you can see uh, the works of Isabel Andresian and Kasper Bosmans. And the opening finally took place on the 6th of June, when the posters in the city really heralded the end uh, of the world. You can see how they looked like. Uh, and uh, some of the newspapers seemed uh, very, very old. Jakub de Barbaro, who designed all these materials, was very pleased with this apocalyptic effect. And of course, it wasn't the opening like it used to be. We basically just opened the door uh, to the museum and uh, we were very afraid that uh, in the face of the restriction and sanitary regime, nobody would want to come to the museum. But fortunately, our fears uh, came out to be completely unjustified. The exhibition was finally visited by 15,000 uh, people within three months. That was around the 70% uh, of the usual attendance at the museum. And observing the COVID statistic, taking care of the audience expectation and comfort, uh, we experimented also with the form of the guided tours. At the beginning, we were performing 20 minutes uh, introductions to the exhibition outside of the museum building. Uh, after we tried one-on-one -on -one, uh, guides and it was very enjoyable experience. And closer to the end of the um, uh, exhibition and uh, we were able to visit the exhibition with the several people at one time and it was a real celebration for us. Uh, before the pandemic, the tours were attended by several dozen to 100 people, so it was a big change for everyone. And the attendance factor uh, until then was actually one of the basic uh, factors for the public museums had to be set aside. And that gave us uh, a chance to think differently about the exhibition format, uh, also in the terms of the degrowth. Many ideas and stories hidden behind the artworks themselves from the exhibition could also serve as a signpost for alternative uh, thinking about the world of art and help to distance ourselves uh, from the idea of continuous progress. I will mention only three of them. The practice of Anna Lawrence Halprin, a choreographer and landscape architect, who in the 60s founded the Sea Ranch on the Californian coast, was very important to us. The sea Ranch was an ecological housing estate in which Halprin's organized workshop for the students. And during the workshop, participants, uh, they were trying to walk lightly on the ground as the native inhabitants of this area did hundreds of years ago with the respect uh, to the nature. And uh, Sea Ranch uh, still is this kind of the ecological housing estate. Uh, Nishiko, the young artist from the Netherlands, focused on yet uh, another important uh, term that is repair. Her repairing earthquake project uh, started in 2011 when the artist began collecting items uh, damaged during the earthquake and tsunami that hit the shores of Japan. Nishiko repaired them with great care, restoring them into their former functionality, but also leaving the scars on them, the tragedy traces. She also tries to find the original uh, owners of the objects. Uh, and when she fails, she looks for the foster parents for them. A repairing Earthquake Project draws attention to a wider problem consuming our world from the exploitation of the natural resources to constant overproduction in which we produce new goods instead of taking care of existing ones. And this is the beautiful work of Simrin Gill. Uh, she sent uh, to us those two uh, beautiful prints by FedEx uh, because she was stuck in Australia during the huge wave uh, of fires. Uh, and it was sent by Economic Post, uh, no crates, no convoy. Uh, and these are just few examples from the exhibition coupled uh, in their conceptual level with some good practices that could be implemented or analyzed, not only in the field of art, I think, but also in the broader context of degrowth. And it quickly became known to everyone that the crisis uh, was coming, so crisis measures were needed. Uh, the planned uh, exhibition program in the museum uh, was supposed to be suspended until the end of the year. And two weeks after the end of the pen Penumbral Age, the 12th Warsaw Under Construction uh, Festival has begun. And it will last until January 17th, so you are all very welcome uh, to come. 
And it's much longer than normally. The festival is curated by Tomasz Fudala and Natalia Shelevich, and it is held this year under the slogan, Something in Common. And the emphasis from the festival, which so far has been devoted uh, broadly uh, to bro broadly understood architecture and some various social aspects of the city culture, has shifted to relations and problems that have become more acute in the pandemic. For example, housing, uh, digital security, city politics uh, towards the artists uh, or migration crisis. And Natalia and Tomek emphasized that uh, while working on, uh, on the festival, they reevaluated the models of curating work as well. The artists did not create uh, works on a given topic, uh, but together with the curators and other members of the working groups, uh, they collaborated in a research dialogue, an equivalent part of the festival is the public program, which is also part of their work. And uh, in the background here, you can see the seven working groups. Uh, they are working also on developing the certain habits and even formal regulations which support will support the communities after the festival is closed. And as uh, Olga Tokarczuk uh, wrote, the pandemic is just one of the symptoms of much bigger transformation. It is impossible to predict the future, but what we can do is to use imagination and try to notice and describe the changes, processes and phenomena that will have an impact on shaping the future world in the chaos of the present. And I think that both exhibitions, the Penumbral Age and Warsaw Under Construction, are tailored uh, to the times of crisis and they don't present the ready, ready recipes uh, and hopefully they are not uh, too didactic, but I hope they provide a space and tools that can be used for the further uh, reflections also about the big growth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Yagna, that was uh, uh, truly wonderful to learn. And again, I had uh, I had the uh, great fortune to see the Penumbral Age um, last July, where although COVID measures were uh, implemented, it also provides something more of a personalized experience with a lot less attendees at any one point in time. But I would love to circle back uh, towards the end, learning more about Warsaw under construction and also about the planning phase of the penumbral age and what additional layers and additional methods uh, uh, you and, and your team needed to consider compared to say maybe any other exhibition that you have delivered previously. Um, but with uh, that in mind, I would love to now continue with our, our final uh, session before we proceed to the Q&A and to introduce Christoph Platz, who is an art historian, curator and exhibition manager. And although has delivered a wonderful um, uh, a CV of, uh, of artistic activity um, in richness. Um, part of that is uh, joining the project management department of Documenta in 2013, in which he later headed, um, coming from a festival point of view now. So since 2018, Platz has been based in Graz, Austria, where he is the head of curatorial affairs at Städtische Herbst, um, which is a festival and teaches at the Institute for Contemporary Art IZK in Graz. So welcome in Christoph and over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks Joe for uh, inviting first of all. This is really great uh, to be here and also among other panelists and uh, interesting contributions. Um, let me start with uh, one thing that was also relevant for our uh, contributions and debate here today um, because as we all know or we all find ourselves in a situation where we look at things retrospectively from 2020 with very different eyes now both to corona and also new ethics new developments in the art world or art industry even better um, one crucial thing is that uh, of course Adding to what you said uh, about Documenta 13, I had the pleasure also to serve for many years for Documenta 14 as head of exhibitions, an exhibition that is still today also in its um, description part about itself known as the world largest and also most important contemporary art exhibition. Um, 
uh, many things to debate at that end already, of course, but uh, 2017 was the interesting part that the exhibition basically shared its monopoly of happening in Kassel in the midst of Germany um, to a bi local situation, which was then moving to Athens in Greece and um, parallelly or a bit, uh, let's say, with a time. Uh, shift happening also um, in Kassel in its home base, so to say. It uh, sparked many debates still today, um, highly uh, discursive uh, um, things around that very uh, yeah, marking or marking point of uh, the development and also art historical perspective of that um, of that show, which is always described as a seismograph of um, artist names, um, practice, questions, curatorial strategies that come up. Um, I moved on after Documenta 14 and back from Athens um, to a very interesting festival that uh, we just closed the third edition of, um, which is actually an annual festival. So um, time, as we all know, and timing is uh, one of the crucial points in exhibition planning and events planning and um, uh, the cornerstones uh, are very crucial and basically follow, following that timeline. Um, so while Documenta is actually happening every five years, and I also used to work on an exhibition that is happening every 10 years in Münster in Germany, Sculpture Projects, namely, um, I was now part of a, of a festival that is has two very important um, characteristics. One is that it's a nomadic festival. It does have a home base uh, offices in a, in a historic palais in the midst of the city, the small Austrian town of Graz. And on the other hand, it's happening annually. So every year there needs to be a a few weeks of festival of Styrian autumn, which would be the um, tr translation of it, Styria is the, the region, the district of Austria where we are happening. We are um, now, or we are located in the second largest town of, uh, of Austria. And the festival, and that is the very crucial thing to it, um, stems back from uh, more than 50 years of history in which it did happen annually um, without any kind of break. And of course, with this kind of heritage, we were facing in March 2020 um, with the lockdown pretty clearly a situation that we saw happening to many of our colleagues who basically had to cancel their events, their festivals, their plans that they have been working on since quite a while, um, since it was just not possible to uh, to be able to make proper plans, um, even of a light version, of a digital version, of compromises, um, which of course run against the curatorial idea of a of a show or a festival or a framework that you draw up, and um, it was clear to us at that point having planned, let's say, for a year almost, a larger museum show, other um, works around the city, um, lots of artist visits, of course, planned. And it was clear to us that that plan needs to be abandoned immediately. And we have to reinvent, which also means reinventing with lots of the artists that we have been in touch with with artists and partners that we have been in conversations with. So we of course started as many others did to think, okay, what could be, what could be the kind of framework for this thing? Um, allow me to say at that point that the first two festivals, 2018, 2019, we did with our director, Ekaterina de Goat, with a group of curators, um, was uh, first one was called 2018 Volksfronten. The second one in 2019 was called 
um, Grand Hotel Abyss after Georgi Lukacs. Um, and the point was that already there we were addressing very much of the political um, uh, timely happenings of, let's say, the right wing shift across uh, not only Europe, but also South America and other countries, and uh, let's say the American continent in, in general, um, we were addressing a crucial question in Grand Hotel Abyss that was uh, expressed by Lukacs in a nice way to say, you know, we all are very comfortable still in our uh, mainly, let's say, European-centered uh, luxury hotel while we look out of the window and we see that um, we are staring in, into the abyss, into the disaster, um, which is, I think, an expression expression that is, you know, very contemporary and, and uh, pretty much reminding us that there's lots of work to do um, also in the cultural sector. And with that festival, um, we were um, for 2020, then on a pragmatic level, basically abandoning plans, um, mainly because of uncertainty uh, of fate, of uh, you know travel of works, let's say loans that we had confirmed and had secured for quite a while. Those people who work in the museum sector, of course, they know the longer processes that are connected to um, loan approaches. Um, and we also, of course, had to speak to artists who were in the process or were stopped in the process of producing a new work for our festival. Uh, we are mainly commissioning new works. Um, 2020 should have been the year where we do a larger historic show, a show with historic material. And having said that, um, I found myself actually pretty, yeah, pretty, um, dazzled actually by the way that um, the the harshness of this crisis hit of course or is hitting first the most weak in the museum industry or in the in the exhibition industry so to say so let's say companies that we were talking with um, to build crates for our loans that our production team was in touch with um, to make actually artworks travel were not existing anymore suddenly. So the crisis basically took away their business, took away entirely their um, practice and are not with us now anymore. So it again basically shows that um, the crisis proof system is only one that is of course big enough and strong enough and is already, let's say the main player system. And um, circling back to the to questions of production conditions, of course, that also affects artists um, very much so. So many artists, many friends, of course, uh, were basically having a pause button on exhibitions, on preparations for shows, for festivals, etc. And with that also to uh, financial possibilities and financial possibilities that secure both um, living their life and doing their practice. And in doing their practice, many of those artists, also many artists that we have been inviting, um, maybe to be said on a side note that we also paid fees for people who were not able then to continue uh, working with us, of course, to, to who said basically, you know, I'm going to focus on a work better uh, for a later point. Um, and uh, we very early on decided to to also um, of course pay for these um, for the situation or to you know have a honorarium for artists who also were already in conversations with us, which should be the case in in any ways. On the other hand, um, we had a couple of artists who were very much embracing the situation that we came up with a new concept. The new concept was called Paranoia TV. So. Our festival basically turned for the amount of time for this four week festival in 2020 into a broadcasting station, a fictional kind of media conglomerate that is broadcasting artistic content um, for those four weeks. And actually until the end of the year, we just prolonged the, um, 
the presence of those films and, and other contributions. So we actually um, came up with um, a contemporary concept that was preparing for that or was basically um, practiced for that situation that the lockdown might never end or the rock lockdown might end and people are actually, you know, allowed to leave their houses again. The most crucial thing for us was to make ourselves to a degree or to the largest degree independent from that. Um, so that was or became a very strong conceptual factor in that where we were approaching artists even saying, hey, you know what, what would you think about producing a series of films? What would you think about to produce a soap? Um, so we are very thankful that we could um, present now content and premiere lots of film, in fact, 55 contributions or 55 new commissions that we have of artists, also um, larger figures, great artists um, who basically did not at all have to change their practice. Let's say John Smith, um, a legend in, in filmmaking and short filmmaking, basically never, he, he didn't have to change his practice. You know, he's, he kept on filming things from his apartment or studio and writing a voiceover or, or having another voiceover, in that case, Boris Johnson, and working creatively or artistically in the editing process mainly. We had artists who are used to work with a larger film crew, basically, who were not able to produce in that manner anymore. So what they were doing, they were basically revisiting earlier material, archive material of their own practice and making something out of it um, that brought to them, like Clemens von Wedemeyer, a completely new edit of material or film material he was working with that uh, beautifully um, became extremely uh, timely, extremely to the point, um, which is a film about a, a trainee or training situation of a catastrophe, uh, um, a natural catastrophe or a big accident that is happening somewhere. So the production conditions and embracing or taking in these production conditions of artists and the very active conversation about that was a very crucial factor to this platform that we get, that we shared um, that was not entirely virtual. So we also did, um, and I'm speaking in past tense because the festival just closed uh, a couple of days ago. Um, we also did things in real life, IRL, that were in town, um, which then of course were streamed or broadcasted. So for us, um, we basically had this time quite a bit the advantage that we are a nomadic festival that has to reinvent itself every year for the following year, can be very quick um, in reacting within a think tank to a situation. And at the same time also has to be thankful towards artists who are joining that matter. Um, maybe on a last note, just to, uh, to tell you that indeed you will find, you still can find the content on paranoia-tv.com or on steilscherherbst.com, which is the more complicated uh, website, of course with a lot of wonderful contributions, a great series by Rabia More, um, Ahmed Ugut made a wonderful work, Tamar Guamares, many other artists who did contribute um, new works um, or a different type of work than you are usually used to, to see from them. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much, uh, Christoph. Um, that was uh, super great to hear. And I, I, I certainly urge everybody to check out Paranoia uh, TV as I will. And also congratulations on the completion of your festival during this time, as we know, it's not easy uh, to deliver a festival in, t in today's age. But um, I, just before uh, I uh, jump ahead with a couple of questions for you, I would just like to remind um, our audience that feel free to enter any questions into the chat. 
Um, and I uh, look forward uh, uh, to posing them to the panel of speakers here and or myself. Um, and then following that, the uh, more informal but direct method of being able to raise your hand in the Zoom function um, so that we can have you ask the question directly to our panelists as well. But I would, I would just like to um, touch on that and say uh, thank you all again from coming from your viewpoints. Uh, it's, it's great to see a wonderful breadth across online community-driven activities, but also community-driven um, with a sense of impact and working with partners in other territories, um, physical organizations that have had to adopt new methods or employ um, a quicker turnaround time in their planning because of maybe um, community pressure uh, uh, from, from audiences on the ground in that territory, and also a festival uh, mentality where it often is the circus comes to town and is very synonymous with the city and an audience that comes to that each year and the pressures there. So um, before I move on to a question for uh, Christoph and Jagna, I'd like, I'd like to uh, circle back to um, Diane and say, if we could um, hear a little bit more about the, the upcoming activity um, um, uh, in, the, in the Lithuania um, and if there are any um, challenges with regards to understanding that territory during today, um, in addition to the territory that you are currently based in as well, with regards to um, how you may uh, reach out to that community and, and uh, understand that territory a bit further. Well, we are actually just at the beginning of it, so, um, but I can sure. share a few learnings already. Like we will have the first um, meeting with the participants normally in two weeks and then we will actually have um um, and then, and then we will have the, the conference uh, really happening in um, uh, on the 16th of, of November at the Mon Museum in Vilnius. So, what we are starting, what we are always doing is actually trying to to talk to people as much as we can. So we do it um, via Zoom, not traveling anymore, um, and and we listen. We take the time to listen. And and lately, what actually came up was the fact that um, collaboration is not really a way of doing and working yet. Um, why, if we actually want to see macro changes um, leading to systemic change, we need to collaborate. We need to actually join forces and, and think about this togetherness, like a, a strong value to follow and, and being able to, to, to um, yeah, collaborate <laughs> um, is, actually quite quite difficult in in few countries or in few teams um, we kept actually trying to highlight um individualities uh trying you know it's what i told about uh just before this meritocracy and this showing off and just actually trying to always compete with each other is actually not a model which will work um, in the future and and this is something that we will work on um, during this in this program in Lithuania trying to find new ways of working together um, cross cross industry cross teams cross museums cross disciplines um, trying to actually gather the right people at the right time um, and create this um, hybrid, um, um, uh, yeah, hybrid team, <laughs> basically. So um, I think this is one big um, issue and one big challenge that we will try to, to work on all together during the six months of program in Lithuania. The second one will be actually to understand that change um, and yeah, being able to foster um, different kind of transformation should actually come with sustainable financial models um, and being able to apply sustainability in your finance is is actually something which is not easy so this will be the second big uh, topic of our of our program on top of um, the ecological transition on, on top of how to transform your local communities into uh, climate champions and on top of others but i think these two um, points are actually the most um, important and the most anchored locally um, and the most relevant locally, actually. Am I, am I replying to your question, Joe? <laughs> yes, yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I was going to touch on the fact that it's great to hear impact at the core of, of what, what you're delivering, you know, organizations and working for one as well in the UK. Um, 
we're so used to having the pressures of also attendance with our activities that we put on in the hope that many people will attend. And now I see, well, certainly from our UK point of view, I can't speak for other territories, but now I see from our point of view that attendance is relaxed as a as a target, it, where, where now it's more about um, commitment to engagement and commitment to impact and commitment to to impact in your local territory, but also how that how that can also be broadcast to other territories in a way that is somewhat more environmentally pleasing. Um, if we look at the city that I'm in right now in Sheffield, it's very much a ghost town um, with one or two exhibitions going on. And those exhibitions may only have five to 10 people a day and they're relatively large institutions, but the arts councils and the British councils um, and the arts institutions here consider more about um, impact of how those exhibitions are and those workshops are set up as a responsible tool and not just a, an aesthetic quality, um, if that makes sense as a response to, to your point. So thank you very much to that. I would like to um, also uh, uh, direct my, my next question uh, briefly to Jagna and Christoph. If we could start with Jagna about the, it was super great to hear about the Prenumbral Age, the, the ethics surrounding it, even, even in the most basic way, hearing about the careering and the art transportation of where work comes from and how it's transported. It's, it really plays heavy on our budgets, of course, these things, but at the same time, it's a, a real significant thing to consider where the artwork is coming from and um, is that the most appropriate method of travel during this time. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the, the planning side of that exhibition and was there a longer leeway, a longer period of time of planning in that particular exhibition than potentially previously to that? Um, primarily due to second guessing everything that you do. Is that is that the right way? No, maybe there's always an alternative way of doing this and something like that. So yeah, you know, yeah, that was uh, that was a very unique situation. We had the comfort to work for a long time. The research for this exhibition it was one and a half years, so it was very uh, comfortable, and we could do you know we could pick a lot of artists. We could. Uh, really go deep into the collections of other institutions and uh, of course uh, that was very good situation but then pandemic came and what was uh, surprising for us that it was that um, uh, of course what changed it was our thinking about the, uh, this exhibition which was really a victim uh, of the topic it was telling about that was amazing but also uh, you know many people commented on that how actual it is <laughs> in this topic and it was uh, pretty like we were really mesmerized we didn't know what to do during this uh, situation with freezing it uh, on the you know last moment but then uh, we had this uh, few months of thinking, rethinking it uh, again, and uh, it occurred that uh, our primal ideas, or the first phase, as you call it, uh, was quite accurate. For example, the exhibition's architecture is a good example. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we asked the Kooperative für Darstellungspolitik from Berlin, uh, the studio, to uh, arrange uh, the auditorium in the middle of the exhibition hall and uh, that was the main part of the scenography. We wanted to create the space for the gatherings, for discussions, uh, for screenings uh, and that was the main idea and then pandemic came and we couldn't do this but the space, uh, the auditorium uh, was there and it had a uh, like completely different faction people were resting then they were yeah. reading the exhibition guide there and uh, it occurred that uh, and architects knew it because we called them in panic before the opening and they said no we are not changing anything just uh, we have to think differently of the space and it was great because people used it as a you know library they were resting there uh, the architecture divided the space so people felt really comfortable in it so I think it uh, all went uh, okay, but uh, you know, it was uh, this slowing down uh, was very needed, although it was in the horrible circumstances. Thank you. That's uh, super, super great to hear. And uh, I guess same question, Christoph, as well, but from a point of view of um, 
changing the notion of your festival output during uh, uh, COVID and uh, how Parano Paranoia TV sort of came about uh, in the sense of its its planning phase and is that a model that you may want to consider employing um, going forward? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, first of all, maybe let me say and absolutely agree that, you know, the kind of forced slowdown is, of course, to many people I talk to, many colleagues, many of us, was kind of a uh, about due time kind of thing. You know, I, had, I mean, my personal feeling at least was that um, uh, also agreeing to what was said earlier, the, the kind of, you know, the feeling at least of competition of um, events uh, with, you know, attention economy was kind of crazy while at the same time the the people in that system, the art workers were absolutely stressed out and, you know, many of them maybe had a lucky situation even finding a, a forced pause or forced break. That goes, of course, versus a pandemic fatigue that is around with many people or depression of some sort uh, of that very specific situation that relates more to the broader picture of, of COVID. But for the institution and at least for us as a curatorial group for a festival that anyways has to invent and produce at a quite immense uh, time or short, short time, um, it was also inspiring to a degree to, you know, suddenly discuss or rediscuss forms very differently, you know, of uh, the example with architecture was a pretty good one because, of course, you suddenly even question most basic comments in uh, or etiquette in a way of, of um, exhibition going as a physical activity. Um, also, you know, suddenly more art, more art historian or art historic um, forms come up suddenly, like male art. You know, we did a project um, or we discussed the project quite a lot, like how can we engage actually into that? Uh, while at the same time there was, you know, the, the, the postal service crisis in the, in the U.S. suddenly happening and we were thinking, okay, how can we um, in, a, in a still ethical way think about, you know, delivering physical letters or postcards to people as an, as an artwork or an edition or something. What we did at least was um, collaborating with the local uh, food deliveries who received a artwork newspaper even without asking for it. So everyone who ordered, uh, ordered a pizza or something, they received a, um, an artwork or a small edition. Um, in the hope that people appreciate their time at home now in a different way and also understand that um, art actually can very actively even intrude, even without being asked in, so to say, but it's not necessarily and all the time a, um, you know, a beautiful evening to go to the opera, um, which of course cannot be replaced in, with forms like that, but at the same time, using that forced break to indeed um, think about or rethink modes of uh, cultural practice. Thank you, Christoph. In fact, that reminds me actually, I received a newsletter about uh, four or five months ago maybe about an opera taking place in Roma, but the audience was all plants. No people, all plants instead. So, um, which was humorous, but uh, extremely artistic in its output. And the fact that we we're invited to experience that was uh, also a contradiction in itself. Um, my question uh, uh, is, is also one that responds a little bit more to one of the questions posed um, in the chat. And that's about that um, if museums and organizations are prone to doing um, certain artistic outputs in a physical sense. And this period of time, or just before this period of time, has taught us of how we need to adapt and reflect quite quickly. Roughly, how long do you think it will be before the new audience age starts to look at artistic institutions or institutions in general and think, okay, this hybrid 
there's uh, this or this onlineness is um, I, how much more can I take of this before we have to start to think of new, innovative, personalized ways of um, uh, gravitating towards our audiences. Um, one being working in the territory itself, uh, Diane, um, in a smaller capacity of attendees potentially. One is posting items. Also, I, I, I was fortunate to go and uh, view a performance in Liverpool not too long ago, but I was posted the items in advance that allowed me to be able to respond to the performance directly there. So yes, that was hybrid in that sense, but it was using old methods to, as a means of, of engagement. So um, I suppose it's a matter of prediction, uh, informal prediction, but how long do you think we could keep this, um, this notion of online or at least hybrid um, uh, uh, continuing in this form before our communities or our current communities uh, potentially, hopefully not, but may start to dissolve where we have to think about new audiences. Question open to anybody on the panel here. <laughs> I'll start with, uh, I will start with Christoph, <laughs> actually um, coming from a festival standpoint. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a very valid question, of course. Uh, to me, it is very much connected to technology or to basically two things, technology and the actual, you know, physical experience. And the question, is it replaceable? I mean, I come from a practice that of course is very physical. Um, I love to be in, you know, exhibition spaces, create and design uh, partly together with architects, partly myself, um, spaces and spatial patterns that are the, the platform or the background for creating a, a tension between artistic positions or working with artists in rooms specifically and site specifically. Um, that is, of course, a, a beautiful thing that you can immerse in a spatial situation. I think all of us or many of us had loved these experiences to, you know, find yourself in a room with an amazing artwork and uh, that is a physical experience that is of course not replaceable by a two-dimensional replacement of some sort. Um, of course a big subject and the whole virtuality question how to join um, is, a, is a bigger subject even more but for me that also poses one drastic question in addressing our current audiences which is technology and ageism, of course, you know, something that has to do with the um, transitional moment of, of, you know, how can I actually explain and help the older um, generations, which are, I don't know, maybe going to the festival of, of ours, you know, Starische Herbst since, uh, since the late 60s. Um, so, uh, inaugurated, you know, 67 already, I have, I have, I'm in touch with people who actually went to the first couple of shows. How can I explain to them that they should ideally install our app, uh, which you can, by the way, still find in the app store, um, which basically provides a better viewing system or a nicer way in, you know, for example, doing bookmarks that you can save things that you really save for later and then can watch on demand artist, artistic contributions. Um, is that gap already too big that we can, you know, find our way to, to explain how that kind of technology works and how can I take in and respect, of course, that people are not at all in touch with this kind of medium. I mean, we all saw the images of people now not only being able, but also being forced to Skype with their families, with elderly homes, with people um, who are actually risk group. Um, and they are getting, let's say, with lots of guidance slowly into that. But at the same time, um, it is a very valid question that you that you asked, you know, how long can we sustain it? Or how, how long can we actually um, endure also a degree of uh, forced non-physical experience while it is also a chance and I deeply believe in that uh, that you know certainly an elitist kind of flying or traveling 
um, uh, perverseness was there because it we all I mean we I guess we I all agree that it's just absurd that you can travel for 80 euros with uh, you know airplane to the opening of a big show right across uh, the continent or even you know change continents this is uh, this is a thing that is not that cannot stand let's say super thank you Christoph. and i guess the same uh, uh, question from a, uh, an arts institution physicality point of view when the age comes when you start to adopt a more semi permanent if you do online manner um and is that is that thought process or degree of planning um in the mind or the 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 fret the planning framework of of moma curators uh, during this time on when this shift if there is a shift may, may occur i wouldn't call it <laughs> maybe a shift i think this hybrid forms um, for sure will stay with us uh, like this online we cannot uh, forget <laughs> this time and we cannot forget those tools uh, that we learned uh, and uh, we will be better prepared but i'm still uh, believing in the <laughs> physical uh, physical uh, space, uh, as Christoph said, uh, I think the Warsaw Under Construction Festival adopted really well uh, to the circumstances that will last, I think, for long, long time now, because uh, the exhibition is just uh, like equivalent part, as I said, to the public programming and. Uh, uh, if you know the limitations are uh, stronger, then it all smoothly uh, goes uh, to the internet. And the same working groups that are normally, if uh, the rules allow, a meeting in the physical space somewhere outside or inside, it all you know uh, they can meet uh, online. And then when uh, when the situation will be better, they will come back uh, to this uh, beautiful space in our exhibition hall and meet in this uh, arena, which is created uh, by the work by, uh, by Zuza Golinska. And I think this uh, hybridity we have to get used to and it will went on, but uh, I, I'm still, uh, you know, a fan of the, of the like ex being in the exhibition and this, uh, sure. this uh, yeah, relations with the artworks there. So I think it's possible, but we have to have it in mind simply that the, the second zone and uh, still exists and we learned a lot and maybe it will somehow uh, <laughs> still be with us. I don't know. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Agna. And my final question uh, for Diane actually is not to do uh, from an exhibition standpoint, it's to do with um, a shift in what we feel maybe our audiences may benefit from uh, uh, during this time. And in terms of a tighter local community-based activity, I found from my side of things, again, only speaking from my territory, that there is a decrease of exhibitions for obvious reasons in the physical sense that we've discussed, but also a decrease in online activity where organizations were shifting their focus from delivering something as a presentation, artistic presentation output to more uh, commissioning and more workshops, particularly a focus on workshops, activities behind the scenes that also resonate with such impact and such development. Um, do you feel um, off the back of, again, the previous question about will there come a time where we have to re-understand the balance of, of artistic output, whether physical or online, do you think there will also be an increased uh, number of workshops and capacity building and developmental programs um, that are more to do with that that community and that engagement um, and such to try better understand our community during this time yeah I actually think that the, the key word here is is community um, and to reply to the question that that you asked before I actually questioned the notion of hybridity we, we kept thinking that I hybrid should be zoom or, or something online and 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 physical but actually uh, your example in liverpool is fabulous the example of christophe about the delivery and the, and the art newspaper and i heard about examples of museums actually starting to write in local newspapers starting to use local radio um, i think that we learned that you could reach out to local communities by using what they use in their daily life and and 
going back to what you said again before about the audience and about the, um, the numbers of, of people actually seeing and visiting is not should not be the question so the question should be about what you say to the right people and and could you actually foster micro local changes and i think when you talk about local communities i hear about neighbors i hear about um, districts i i hear about one museum becoming part of a district and actually fostering yeah, beautiful relationships and and it could be with um, workshops it could be with so many different kind of programs just like for instance um the um, uh, Museum Shansky in Katowice actually decided to change um, the green space around the museum into a community garden and actually providing um, gardening um, workshops, gardening sessions, uh, explaining what is permaculture and, and other new um, gardening practices and actually uh, teaching more and explaining more about the local biodiversity. And I think like we, we need to think local and, and if we need to use Zoom or, or whatsoever, we, we, we should actually decide to go in this direction really if we need it. And, and I think this should not be the first option if we think about a hybrid format. It should be one option among others. So, yeah. <laughs> What a wonderful note to end on. I, I, thank you very much, for, very much for that. In fact, if there was a workshop or a, an opportunity to attend something more environmentally um, field friendly, uh, participatory, uh, uh, for sure, I, I'd uh, attend in seconds. But um, on that note, I'd, I, I'd like to thank uh, uh, you, Diane and Jagna and Christoph for um, attending, participating and devoting your time to this, but also to the cause in general and hearing of the, the ethics that surrounds your, your artistic and curatorial practices. And uh, I think it goes without saying that we, we wish you um, all of the luck uh, with the challenges that are posed to all of our organizations during this time. And uh, we, we certainly look forward um, to seeing your exhibitions, workshops, and festivals, either in digital, physical, or hybrid form. So thank you. And of course, if I had an audience here, I uh, for sure, would be hearing a, a, a clap right now. So we'll expect a virtual one during this time. Um, but again, thank you very much to our audiences for attending today on uh, Zoom, on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and uh, to uh, say that while uh, the panel has ended here, that we have several wonderful days left of the festival, taking us to the 25th on Sunday. But shortly following this at 8 p.m. Central uh, Eastern uh, Summertime, we will have a collection of films uh, from 8 p.m. and they are The Last uh, Mowers uh, by director Andres Zaleski, um, First Pole on Mars by director Agnieszka Elbanowska, and Fat Cathy by director Julia Pelka. And of course, the fourth edition of the audio program, The Sound Intervention Service with the artwork Quiet Rush by artist Zorka Volney. But for now, we'd like to thank you very much all for joining us and thank you again to our speakers and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brad.